Hey everyone, welcome to week nine of Advanced Econometrics. This week we're talking about generalized extreme value models. Uh, the most common of which that you might have heard of is the nested logit model. So just to quickly recap, last week we talked about generalized method of moments, which finished up a few weeks talking more about the estimation side of things. And now we're gonna jump back to talking about uh, the structural econometric models themselves by talking about some, some new, uh, new models for a few weeks. And so this week we're gonna talk about, like I said, generalized extreme value models. We'll talk about the nested logit, the two-step nested logit, some properties of the nested logit model, some of the empirical considerations to have in mind when you're working with the nested logit model, and then some of the other generalized extreme value models that go along with the nested logit model. Those will each be their own video for lectures this week. Then in class, we're going to talk about this nested logit example in R. The reading for this week is all out of the train textbook. It's chapter four. So take a look at that chapter before you watch these videos. I think that'll be the best way to, to get this material. So let's just start by jumping into the nested logit model. Uh, but first, let's actually take a step back and do a bit of a recap of the course to this point. So we started by talking about structural econ econometric models. We, we the first week we even just did an overview of what that even means. But then over uh, the, the, the subsequent few weeks, we talked about the random utility model to deal with uh, discrete choice problems and then the logit model, which is a specific example of a discrete choice model using the random utility model. Then we took a, a bit of a diversion to estimation methods. After we had set up the logit model, we talked about ways that we could estimate the logit model. We talked about maximum likelihood estimation and then applied that specifically to the logit model. And then last week we talked about the generalized method of moments and then again applied that to the logit model. Well, now that we know those estimation methods in kind of the most uh, simple model, the logit model, we're going to switch back over to talking about some different discrete choice models that are going to allow for richer representations of individual decision making. So this week we're talking about the nested logit model, which is going to allow for unobserved correlations between alternatives. And we'll see why that can in many cases be an improvement over that most simple logit model. And then next week, we're gonna talk about the mixed logit model, which is going to allow for taste variation due to unobserved factors. And we'll really see next week where uh, uh, the benefits that come from, from that kind of uh, model setup. But first, let's just start with the nested logit model. We're going to spend a few slides here talking more about kind of the intuition and then get into the actual details of the model. But the basic idea behind the nested logit model is that it relaxes that sometimes over sometime overly strong assumption of the nested logit model. Um, and it does so by allowing for, for those unobserved or, or random components of utility, those epsilon terms, to be correlated within the same decision maker. So different alternatives for the same decision maker, the unobserved utility can be correlated. Whereas with the logit model, we assume that those had to be IID. And the, the, the way that this is done is that the nested logit model groups alternatives into nests. And so if two alternatives are in different nests, then they're still going to be uncorrelated with one another, just like under the logit model. But if two alternatives are in the same nest, we will allow for some correlation between the unobserved utility terms for those alternatives. We'll actually estimate the extent to which those unobserved utility terms are correlated with one another. And so one of the nice things about this is that it, it, the, the, the allowing for these correlations relaxes those kind of restrictive and rigid substitution patterns that we got out of the logit model. And so in fact, in this case, what we're gonna end up with is that IIA is gonna hold for two alternatives within the same nest, but that IIA will not necessarily hold for alternatives in different nests. And so we're just kind of relaxing, instead of assuming that IIA holds for every set of alternatives across the board, we're now gonna have some, some different uh, some different patterns resulting from this. And we'll see that as we get more into the model over these videos. But let's look at an example. Suppose we have commuters in Boston. They have four alternatives to commute to work. 
And we want to model that, that commute mode decision. They can drive alone, drive in their own car by themselves. They can carpool with coworkers. They can take the bus or they can take the train. Well, you can imagine that you can kind of form form some nests out of these different uh, different alternatives. Uh, you might kind of think of there being a private car nest where maybe people, uh, certain individuals just might prefer to be in their own car or, or the car of a, a friend or coworker. And so then we might want to say that drive alone and carpool could be nested together into kind of a private car nest. And then bus and train could be uh, a public transit nest. Some people might prefer or, or get or, or have particular disutility from taking public transit and that would apply to both the bus and the train and so we can put those together in their own public transit nests. So we can have two nests, car nests for driving and carpooling and a transit nest for bus and train. And then we would allow for driving and carpooling, the unobserved utility of driving and carpooling to be correlated for an individual and the unobserved utility of the bus and the train to be correlated for an individual. We would not, however, under this kind of nesting structure, allow for driving and taking the train to be correlated. Those would still have uh, independent uh, epsilons or unobserved utility terms. But of course, you could probably rationalize a different set of nests for the same problem. I'll let you think about that on your own, see if maybe you could come up with a different set of nests that could also be rationalized for a commuter making this kind of commute choice. And so I think that just shows that choosing nests is still more of an art than a science. There's not, this isn't gonna make our uh, substitution patterns fully flexible. We're still gonna have to impose some structure on the type of, uh, on the, the kind of selection of nests and that there is some researcher decision-making that goes into that process. Okay, now that we kind of have a little intuition and an example, let's talk about the actual uh, kind of formal definition of a nested logit model here. So what we're gonna do is partition our capital J alternatives into capital K non-overlapping subsets that we're gonna denote by a capital B. So we're gonna have B1, B2, all the way up to capital BK. And we're gonna call those things nests. And I just wanna highlight one thing here. We're partitioning all J of our alternatives. So every alternative has to be in a nest. And these are non-overlapping nests, meaning each alternative can be in exactly one nest. They can't be, in, they can't be left out. Uh, an alternative could be its own nest. We could have just a single alternative in a nest, uh, or we could have many alternatives in a nest, but each alternative has to be in exactly one nest. And we can have as many nests as we want, so long as the, these, these properties hold. So, you know, if we had 100, 100 alternatives, we could think about setting up, you know, 50 nests or something. We, we, you know, they're, 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 we could have a lot of nests here, even though that example I showed only had two. So then the utility for each alternative, we're gonna stick with our random utility setup, uh, random utility model setup here. So e the utility for each alternative is again, uh, gonna be denoted capital U, which can be decomposed into representative utility capital V and this epsilon term, which is that unobserved or, or random error, uh, random utility for each, uh, for each alternative. But under the nested logit model, we're going to say that the vector of unobserved utilities, so for one decision maker, all of their epsilons, all of those unobserved utilities, which we treat as random, so we can think of these as kind of the joint random draws of unobserved utility, those are going to have the cumulative distribution shown here. It's a little messy. I don't want to get into the details of it, but... Uh, I will just kind of summarize it real quickly. First of all, I wanna say this is a type of generalized extreme value distribution. And we'll talk about other examples of generalized extreme value distributions in the last video this week. Every, everything else, we're gonna stick with this nested logit model. In this case, the marginal distribution of any one random utility or unobserved utility term is extreme value. So the marginal distribution is still extreme value, just like it was for the logit. It's just that this kind of uh, structure of this cumulative joint cumulative distribution here gives us some correlation between those epsilons, which have uh, an extreme value marginal distribution.
And then because the innermost term here, we're adding up over all alternatives within nest K, so all alternatives within the same nest, what this means is that we're going to get no covariance or correlation for two alternatives in different nests, but we might get some correlation or covariance for alternatives that are in the same nest together. Again, it's this kind of inner term where we're adding up over uh, alternatives in a nest that's going to give us that uh, that correlation. Also the fact that we're going to divide epsilon by this lambda k term. Lambda k will be defined for each nest and that's going to be a measure of independence within the nest where a one here is going to give us complete independence and that will actually equal the logit model and something closer to a zero here will tell us that these uh, random utility terms within a nest are not very independent, or in other words, they are dependent or correlated with one another. So that's the formal definition. I think all of this will make a lot sense, well, a lot more sense as we kind of start talking through some examples and, and kind of the results. I think the best way to start with that, though, is to talk through how we can conceive of a nested logit model as actually being kind of a two-step set of logit models that we're going to talk about in the next video.